Okay. I'd like to call to order the City of Capitola regular City Council meeting. Please rise for the, well, let's do Pledge of Allegiance first, right? Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before we sit down, I'd like a moment of silence and recognition of the, of the people who died and defended us on 9-11. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call. Council Member Story. Here. Council Member Peterson. Here. Council Member Brooks. Here. Council Member Botworth. Here. Mayor Bertrand. Here. I'd like to recognize that uh, Kingston Rivera is running the channel tonight, and that could be on the um, website also if you're not watching tonight. Thank you very much. With that, we have some presentations. And I'd like to make a proclamation. Is um, Mary Smith here? Yes. Okay. I practice this at least three or four times. So sometimes my enunciation is not so great. But um, this is City of Capitola's Mayor Proclamation honoring Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services and declaring this month, 2019, as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas National Childhood Cancer Awareness Month inspires us all to tell the stories of the brave children who battle cancer every day and thank the loved ones and healthcare professionals and communities who lift them up. Each year, one in 285 children in our country are diagnosed with cancer. Despite improved survival rates, cancer remains the leading cause of death by disease amongst children. Families of children with cancer in the city of Capitola receive essential services from Jacobs Heart Children's Cancer Support Services, a local organization that has gained national awards and recognition for improving the quality of life for hundreds of local children with cancer and their family members. Jacobs Heart holds the memories and honors legacies of hundreds of children from our local community who have been lost to cancer, ensuring that their precious memories will never be forgotten. The oncology department at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford has worked closely with Jacob's Heart for the past 21 years as his trusted community member in providing care that addresses the emotional, practical, and financial struggles for families of children with cancer in Capitola and beyond. Two thirds of children cancer patients will have chronic health conditions as a result of their treatment toxicity. Let us renew our commitment to prevent, treat, and cure childhood cancer, and together ensure that all children can experience the full and healthy lives they deserve. Now therefore, I, Jacques Bertrand, Mayor of the City of California, uh, Capitola, hereby declare September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the city of Capitola and honor Jacob's Heart Children's Cancer Support Services for 21 years of outstanding support to our community. And I have a proclamation for you. I'd like to thank the mayor and the city of Capitola for proclaiming September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month and extend an invitation to all of you to our Kid Rages Carnival on Sunday, September 29th. It's at the Watsonville Plaza from 12 to 4. Hope you could be, make it and support our families. Thank you. Is it okay if we get a picture? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Do it. I don't know who has the camera. Oh, you have
Moving on to, let's see, where are we on this? On 2B. Yeah, 2B, update on city's deferred compensation 457 plan for employees. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, the City of Capitola offers a voluntary deferred compensation plan in which employees are able to defer a portion of their income on a pre-tax basis to save for retirement. There's currently 26 active employees as well as 32 retired employees participating in the plan. And I'd like to point out that there's no cost to the city for this employee benefit. All fees associated are pay paid by the employees and retirees that are participating in the plan. Our current plan is administrated by ICMA and they charge 0.9% of an administrative fee for the assets under management and it came to staff's attention that that seemed like it was a little bit on the high side. So we contacted ICMA and tried to negotiate the a fee reduction and we weren't successful in that effort. So we issued an RFP in um, mid-January and received five proposals in mid-July, uh, which included a proposal from ICMA, which had a reduced fee. And then also from CBiz, Empower, Nationwide, and Voya, which are some of the bigger players in the deferred compensation market, if you will. Um, we then put together a selection committee that consisted of one employee each from the POA, ACE, and mid-management mid bargaining units, as well as myself. That selection committee met last week and unanimous, unanimously agreed that Voya offered the best value with their fees at 0.35%. Um, what that'll translate into for employees, depending on what their situation is, is savings anywhere from twenty to $87,000 over the course of their career in reduced fees, with the average active employee saving about $45,000 over a 20 year time frame. Um, this transition to the new plan is, which I just had the first uh, kickoff call this morning, transition is gonna take 10 to 14 weeks, and during that time I'll be sending out correspondence to employees as well as retirees on what the changes will entail and what their new investment options will be. And then once that transition is complete, we're gonna set up some workshops that are hosted by Voya here on site and help employees with their retirement planning. So just wanted to provide that update this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we did not have a closed session. Um, so are there any additional materials? None. Okay, great. So this time uh, we're open for public comments on any item that's not on today's agenda. So please come to the dais and if you'd like, identify yourself. Hi, good evening council members. My name is Shannon Munns. I'm the communications specialist with the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. And I'm here tonight to let you all know about a number of vacancies we have on our elderly and disabled transportation advisory committee. So this is an important committee to the RTC uh, community, mem community members work with RTC staff and commissioners to identify and meet transportation needs of people living with disabilities, senior citizens, and low-income communities. So citizen committees such as this are vital to the work that the RTC does as they advise the commission on criti critical transportation-related issues, policies, uh, plans, programs, and projects that infect the entire community. Currently, we have a number of vacancies on this committee, including a representative for the Capitola area and an alternate, um, and a number of other throughout the county. So we're trying to do a really robust recruitment to get that committee fully staffed because it really is vital to have people from all over the county on that committee. So I just wanted to let you all know about that tonight, and if you have any ideas of people that might be a good fit from this area, please let us know. Um, we're gonna be doing um, our, our, we're going to be doing recruiting through the end of November and then hopefully in December seat people on that committee and get it filled. So I do have some flyers here if anybody is interested. It has all the eligibility criteria and stuff that you can hand out and it has our email and phone number. People can email us, call us. But again, we would love any input that you have. If you have any ideas of people who might be a good fit, we'd love to get representation from Capitola. Okay, great. Hey, thanks. Um, so thanks. Linda, you could... You could publicize this on, yes. okay, thanks. Yeah. Sam, you have a comment? Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, a question. Um, thank you for coming yes. um, um, and to fill the E&D tag, but I was wondering if you could let the audience know and out on the TV as well, uh, if there are any particular qualifications uh, required to so, yeah, be the, eligible. The only eligibility required, let me actually, there are 
they're on here, let me just read them off what they are. Okay, so to be eligible, you need to meet one of the following requirements. Either be 60 years or older, be a transit rider 60 years or older, be a person living with a disability, be a paratransit rider, or be a representative from a service that works with seniors and disabled individuals. So you only have to meet right. one of those criteria. Right. Thank you, that's yeah. great. And also, what are the kind of expectations if someone were interested, what would they be getting themselves into, or how could they go find out? Yeah. Okay, so this committee meets every other month. They meet the second Tuesday of every other month, 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. Um, they work on a number of projects during that time. Um, some of the things that they've recently worked on, they created an annual unmet paratransit and transit needs list. They identified accessible pedestrian network improvements throughout the county. They came up with a list of specialized transportation service providers in the area. So just all kinds of different things to really reach, help that community be able to move around the county more so. And we only ask that they, they meet every other month. It's a minimal commitment, um, but we really would love the input and we want as many community members involved in that as we can get. Yeah, okay, so, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. I might add that the people on this committee get a first-hand look at many of the things that make it to the RTC board. So their uh, input is appreciated. Please come forward. Hi there, I'm Gail. And um, I have come up here before and my only purpose tonight is to um, bring attention to a health hazard in our community that is so ubiquitous that we don't even know it exists. <laughs> And it relates to the cancer that children are experiencing. And to illustrate my point, I want to bring this, I'm going to give you a copy of this article where parents demanded the removal of a cell tower from an elementary school after four students and three teachers developed cancer. Mm -hmm. The cell tower was on the playground for 10 years. It takes time to develop a tumor. Um, they say, the parents threatened to pull their children from the school unless the tower was removed. They actually had to keep 200 children, more than half of the children, out of school. And they finally did plan to remove this tower. So um, this microwave radiation, which is in our cell phones, in our pockets, under our desks, in a Wi-Fi router, in our businesses and offices and libraries. By the way, France is removing will not allow Wi-Fi in nurseries and preschools. This is so ubiquitous, we don't know what it is. There's no way we would accept this technology if we really knew what it was, because the experts won't, such as Barry Trower. He is a retired British Royal Navy microwave weapons expert who came out of retirement just to alarm people about this technology. There is um, an increase in colorectal cancer in young people. So anyway, um, I'll, read, I'll read a little bit of this article. Efforts to reduce colon and rectal cancers have been a striking success story for those over 50 years old. Incidents among older Americans declined 32% between 2000 and 2013, due largely to better screening. But the story for young adults is very different. Those born around 1990 now face four times the risk of developing rectal cancer and twice the risk of colon cancer in their 20s, compared to those born around 1950, according to the American Cancer Society. Even though the rates are still relatively low, um, According to the National Cancer Institute's most recent annual report released last week, colorectal cancer is the most common cancer among men between the age of 20 and 49. No one can explain this apparent contradiction, Dr. Lee told Microwave News. Known risk factors for colorectal cancer include obesity, an unhealthy diet, and lack of physical activity. But the younger generations are more conscious with better diets. Okay. So I will give you a copy of this. Thank you for that two. information. I appreciate it. In the future, I'll give you some experts you can consult with. I don't okay. have that information tonight. Okay, thanks for coming this evening. Uh, we have another person. Thank you. Yes. Hello. 
I'm Cherie McCoy, Capitola homeowner and resident for over 21 years. And my comments are regarding the Capitola street safety as well as the Capitola Mall presentation given by Merlone and Geyer Partners back in June 11th. And I want to thank Steve Public Works for meeting with me. I did contact them and so I told them I have lots of great ideas on how to use the space for our good. And three minutes goes real fast, so I will present to you an ode to Times Square. Lovely Capitola, 1.68 miles, 10,000 people living here with beautiful smiles. Traffic study was done on 41st, claims Capitol is no safer. Matter of fact, it's worse, especially the corner 41st and Claire's. To resolve traffic issues there, nobody dares. It's right by the ghost town, Capitola Mall, which we all agree needs a major overhaul. Dining, shopping, movies, just a thin disguise. Huge residential complex, Capitola, be wise. Yes, real estate is lucrative, more so than clothes. Don't let them pave the way right under our nose. Friends and family gathering, now isn't that worthy? Don't mind the living units here, 630. One, two bedroom units and space for a car. 1,100 spaces, is that going too far? Two, three, five stories, village hotel below? Depends on how you look at it, how low can we go? Old people drive at night, that's what they say. Traffic impact will be light for the rest of the day. Optimize the transit center, now that would be nice. A population band-aid, so you better think twice. More people, more cars, what are you doing to us? Not all the new residents will be riding a bus. And just think, they're all driving on 41st. Capitola's quaint community about to burst. The Times Square Mecca, built to bring in money. More people will be driving there now. Isn't that funny? Capitola, please wield the, wield the great power you're owning. Be careful when considering property rezoning. Outdoor restaurant dining, a great place to go, yet Capitola doesn't need a Santana Row. Entertainment complex, now that's what we need. Not a Capitola sellout for money, for greed. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the record. Appreciate that. Oh, we never got. Um, okay. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, anyone else that would like to speak? Okay. Seeing none, let's bring it back to um, item seven: appointment of a children's network alternate. Um, can we go to six? Yeah, six. Well, we just finished six. That's public comments. Six. Well, I have here on eight, so maybe it's, it's out of order on what I've got here. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, yeah, we usually do the city council comments after public comments, but on here it's out of order. Okay, any comments from the city council members? I have none. Okay. I, I do. You do, okay, I great. I do. Um, I just like, so I was able to visit New Brighton Middle School today and meet with the principal and assistant principal, and I just received some really good feedback about the after school pilot program that's just recently kicked off. They were really excited to have Nikki and her team out there, and they were ranting and raving on how great it is. Um, and they did mention to me that there are some families who are unable to afford the program at this time. When we discussed it at the last meeting, um, it was brought up. So I'm hoping that staff can maybe bring forward um, some options in creating a scholarship program or some sort of from the dedicated children's fund for the after school pilot program. And thank you again to Nikki and her team. They, like I said, they were so pleased with the program. That's it. Okay, I have no comments myself. So um, then on to boards and commissions. A quick question. Yes. Mr. City Manager, is there any funds left available that we didn't allocate in the children's fund? There are. We have unallocated children's fund revenue from this year. Would something like that be something we could consider for uh, meeting the criteria? Uh, yeah, I think staff can identify a number of options and put it on a future agenda. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> That's it. Okay. That's it. Boards and commissions. So who's going to give this report for appointment of the city? Okay. I will. Uh, we had a request to um, appoint an alternate to the Children's Network Cabinet. Councilmember Brooks is our representative, and she was hoping to have some backup. Uh, we received um, an application from Kristen Murphy, who is the principal of Soquel Elementary. Um, I don't believe she's in the audience. With their Older, she didn't need um, to be here this evening, but um, we are recommending her appointment as the alternate. It's after school night tonight, so she couldn't make that, it. Well, that's <laughs> a good reason. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, do we need an action on this? We do? Is there a motion? Yeah, I move that we uh, approve Kristen Murphy as the city's alternate on the Children's uh, Network Cabinet. Okay. I'll second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those but I was just suggesting, I mean, to see if there was any public comment on the action. Okay. Mm -hmm. Seeing none, bring it back to the vote, which we just did. Okay, it passes. So let's go on to a reappointment of historical museum board youth member. Yes, um, last year around the same time, we had our first youth uh, appointment to one of our advisory boards. That was Joshua Henshaw, um, who joined the museum trustees. Um, that worked out very well. He has asked, um, to join them for a second term, and they have recommended that. So if we, by um, vote, you would like to um, assign him to a second term, we will keep him at work. Okay, any comments from the board here? Any comments from those in attendance? Seeing none, is there a motion? I move reappointment. Second. Second, okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so let's move on to the consent agenda. So we have a number of things on the consent agenda. Are there any items that people would like to remove and discuss later? I have some questions about item C. Okay. And maybe that would be fairly quick, so. This is the Santa Cruz Metro Record System Agreement. Should we discuss now or should we hold it to the end of the agenda tonight? Are you asking for it to be pulled or just for discussion? You just said you had some questions. That's correct. Yeah, so, um, yeah. It's the mayor's prerogative of. Yeah, I have no problem with you answering questions. I think that would be fairly quick. Yes, I think so too. Okay. Should I proceed? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, on the contract, it mentions that there would be some cost savings to the city. Uh, but I was wondering if there was any estimate of how much the cost savings would be, and there didn't seem to be any um, uh, quantifiable numbers about what the total cost of, you know, the participation would be. And I'm just wondering if that's maybe still pending or. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, Council Member Story. So this item is to amend a memorandum of understanding that we've had uh, historically with the other cities in the county, uh, wa at least Watsonville, Capitola, and Santa Cruz, to jointly provide records management services uh, to do it together. Um, the amendment in front of you this evening is to add Santa Cruz County as a, I guess that would be a fourth member to our records management system. Mm -hmm. The net effect of that decreases our percentage of the overall cost. My recollection, I don't have the staff report in front of me, um, actually I should have the backup data in front of me, but I think it takes us from about six percent, so, so about eight and a half percent to about six percent of the total pro SCRMS costs. Um, I know. The complicating factor is that at the same time, we're also purchasing a new records management system. That was something that we've been going through the last year or so. We talked about it in the budget. And so the records management's whole cost structure is going up by a factor of about 3x this next these kind of last couple of years. So even though our percentage of the overall MOU is going down, our costs went from around, I want to say, about 10000 a year to about $30,000 a year, which is where they're going to be for, for the next 10 years when we pay off this record management system. Okay. Is that? Yeah, no, I, I, I got that. Um, so our share is going down to 6%, but the total expenditures are because of new equipment. Um, I guess the bottom line is the amount that we budgeted in um, 
uh, in our 1920 budget, 34,921. Is that sufficient to cover? Yes. Uh, yeah, so we, those packages. when okay. we adopted the 911 and the SCRMS budget up at the 911 center this year, we anticipated those costs. Um, we actually are a little bit high this year, so the, uh, the costs in coming years will uh, decrease a little bit. Okay, great, thank you. One final question, and this is on page, uh, packet page 30. Um, there's a reference to support the CoPlogic citizen reporting system. I just is is that a like a business name or I wasn't co project what I think I would need to defer to our chief on that one. Okay. Sorry to have to have you come up here for that, but I'm putting you at the end next time. Good <laughs> evening, Mayor Grant, uh, Bertrand, Council members. Cop Logic is Cop a, Logic. a okay. Cop Logic is a specific vendor name that's been utilized by all law enforcement in virtually all of Northern California. It's an information exchange uh, program um, managed and housed out of Santa Clara County. We participate in, right. the, in the region here as members of CopLogic. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to recognize Ed. He has a question about item 8B. Yeah, I just have a quick comment on B. I, I see a limited amount of people in the audience and I think I know exactly what the people here are for. So I'm just gonna ask uh, Catherine Parker, are you here for item B? Is that uh, the one that's interesting you? Or are you here for another item? Yeah, you did write a letter and I just wanted to acknowledge that you wrote a letter and, and uh, just wanna see if you'd allow her to make her comments before yeah, we- Yeah, that's on. fine. Yeah. Oh, I, I was gonna ask If, if you don't have a comment, I have- well, I, I read your letter, and I think I'll go ahead and respond, and, and I think this is a good time for you to, to introduce it to our new city attorney. We have a new city attorney. Uh, our contract had expired, and your comments was about, you know, our need to have consultants or better information for the things that are going to involve us in the future. And I want you to know that part of the reason we chose this firm is they were more diversified. They bring specialty people in all the areas. One of those was Coastal Commission. So without having to hire a consultant, we have so many more uh, – services at, at our at our just uh, that are available to us so I just want to let you know that that's the road we're proceeding on okay and I didn't want you to sit around all night if that's what you're here for so okay. no, I was going to ask was going to ask for comments from the public so yeah. that would have been your time to, you. to talk but uh, thanks for bringing that up Ed. so um, I will now ask for comments from the public if there's any comments that you're welcome to come forward no Okay, so that's going to come back to us later. So is there a motion on the consent calendar? Motion to adopt consent calendar. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we move on to general government public hearings. Um, 9A, application for the Capitol Village and War Business Improvement Association to display banners and holiday wreaths and trees in the village. Staff report, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. As the item said, we're taking our first application for a village decoration. Um, give you a little bit of background. Um, something happened here. The uh, BIA, Wharf and Village BIA, has uh, given us actually two applications. One is for putting banners on a street light poles throughout the village. And the second is for the holiday um, decorations that they've done in the past, which have consisted of of wreaths on the street poles and holiday trees at the intersection of Stockton Avenue, Cap Ave, one at the Mercantile, one at Cap Ave and Monterey. These are the typical locations where we see the holiday trees in the village. So just to give you a quick map, um, obviously this is the Esplanade and Capitol Avenue. So the street lights they've identified that all have banner hangers on them are in the areas where there are businesses. So along Cap Avenue, along one side of Stockton Avenue, along the Esplanade to the point of San Jose in the area where there are no businesses along the Esplanade, uh, there would be no banners hang, hung in that area. They did include some um, banners along San Jose Avenue. And then the tree locations, as I said, one in front of Quality Market, one in front of the Mercantile, one in front of Susan's Ice Cream over here. Um, so I just uh, have two slides on the proposed banners that they um, have per, uh, included in their application. There are pictures uh, taken throughout the village. Uh, a couple, there's 10 of them. Um, I think the B 
BIA plans to kind of use different banners on different poles at different times depending on what, for example, the one back here with the dining would probably be along the esplanade. Uh, these would be along the esplanade. Some of the other ones would be uh, along Capitol Ave. So I think they intend to use a mixture of these uh, as we go through. Um, looking at the application and compliance with the policy, um, the uh, policy requires that the uh, banners or the decorations promote the city or the village, and in this case they do do that. There's no advertising of any specific business or product, and the BAA has the required insurance. So from that standpoint, they do comply with the policy. Um, that really concludes my report and the actions. There's, so there's two applications here. One is for the streetlight decorations, which includes the banners and the wreaths on the streetlights. And the second application is for the holiday trees. Um, you could take separate actions and, and treat these separately if you want, or they could be both uh, under one action. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions of Steve? Ed. On the pictures that were displayed there, are those examples or are those actual pictures that they are, are considering using? So we do have a BIA representative, Anthony from Mijos, and I think he can uh, answer that. So Anthony Guajardo, representing the BIA. Those are ones that we would like to use, that we've kind of gone through the stock take of what we've had that doesn't represent businesses, doesn't represent the Venetians, kind of feedback. But like I said, this is something we're going to try to do that we would be seasonal and throughout the year. So we like your feedback so we can get it right the first time. Prefer to do it right, that we can use them year round and multiple years, and we want to go with a higher quality that's going to last three or four or five years rather than something that's going to blow away with the wind after one. I appreciate that, Anthony. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before you go, may I, Mayor? Um, um, Anthony, I wanted to ask you about the banners. Um, will they be framed, you know, so they're, well, Maintain their integrity, or are they just going well, to be hanging? They won't be framed, but they will be the, like the seams out there. We're using Pleasure Point designs, but they we're going with a higher quality one than we've used in the past. Uh, I think last year or two years ago, we had a different ones that didn't really last up, and they were a cheaper brand. These are going to be the higher quality, so that the images don't fade with the sun or with the mm -hmm. weather. That they're really high res, so they should last pretty well. That was what the quote we got was that they would be, be pretty pretty durable. Right, and will they be affixed? Um, to the light poles at the top and the bottom, so they maintain mm -hmm. that right. visual integrity. That's right. great. And then some that we'll have will be double-sided based on where uh, on the streets that we're going to put up. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from the audience on this? Thank you for coming. Seeing none, bring it back for an action here, and I do have uh, some comments on my own. So um, I went around to uh, various businesses in the village today and tried to find someone who was involved in um, choosing the banners and putting this program together. And I only found one person. Um, but I did get an interesting comment. And one of the comment, uh, this comment was basically referred to the city um, working with the BIA in a more proactive way on a number of things, not just these banners, but Christmas decorations and other actions like that to sort of have a joint way of moving together before something comes before the city council. So I'm just proposing that we ask the BIA and you're our rep, you know, to see if that's really an issue. I don't want to see a problem addressed that's not there. And if it is an issue, maybe come back to city council and we could move on from there. Are you looking for my comment on that? Is the yes, BIA I am. rep? Yeah, um, I mean, m my understanding is that the city council having a representative to the BIA is a way for the BIA and the city to work together. Um, if there's recommendations for further um, collaboration or, or other ways for the city and the BIA to um, come together, if it's uh, p further meetings, joint meetings, public forums, whatever that may be, I'm, I'm sure that the membership would be open to it, or at least I would be open to bringing it to the membership. Um, if there if there are other recommendations for how we can all best work together. Okay, great. So I wasn't sure if it's a big issue, but you know, if it comes up, or you could ask. Me. Sure. So I looked for Karn; she wasn't around and such. But um, I look for other people too. Is there a motion or any more questions or answer? I just wanted to comment. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, two th I'm glad it's in two uh, motions because I see one is, uh, I just want to acknowledge that I think the trees the last couple of years have been fabulous. Uh, guys hit a home run on that. And the uh, wreaths, uh, I, I did great. Some people have suggested they could be larger. I'll leave that up to you guys. Um, uh, but but I think that uh, that is great. And on, on that item, I'm prepared to make a motion that we adopt item two for the uh, wreaths and trees. I'll second that. And on item one with the banners, um, I have concerns about the banners. Um, I think what, what, what I'm reading in this is these are seasonal banners. So if it's a seasonal banner, that means they're up in all the seasons, which pretty much means there will be a banner of some time up year round. And I think it's great. They're gonna be colorful and they're gonna be lively and they're gonna spread it. But um, I'm concerned about the content in the pictures and the quality of the pictures. And so my recommendation is that uh, prior to approving uh, that policy, or as, as part of that policy, try to be consistent with our administrative policy on village decorations, is that the pictures be submitted to the Art and Cultural Commission, and then if they find the pictures to be pleasing or suitable, then uh, they can be brought to the City Council, which is part of the, uh, the process for final approval. And that's my motion. Any comments on this? Is I, there a second to it, first I, of all? I have some comments. Um, okay. In addition to that, it's just for additional feedback for you, Anthony, is that um, there's a clear lack of diversity in the photos, and there are no children represented in any of them. Um, so that would be my charge to, if it's the art and cultural or whomever at that time, to really look at that to make sure that that's included. Would you like that to be a friendly amendment to my motion? Please. I'm still looking for a second. Sam, you have some comments? Well, I was, well, I was waiting you, to you see started, if there was a I second. <laughs> oh, I'm so, well, no, we don't have a second yet. There's still I, comments at this point. I had a second. That, that was on the, the, the trees and the reeds. Okay. Yes, yeah, th just a motion on this one right now. Okay, so we're, we're not. We don't have a second yet. We're just okay. getting comments. We're discussing the second item before we're voting on the first. My, my recommendation is to take the first item first, vote on it, and then you can make a yeah. motion. Uh, well, it was put in that order, so we're, okay. So we're still discussing item one, and we don't have a second on that. No, we, we I, I do have a, on item one, we have a second. Uh, it was motioned by Ed and second by Trees and Reese was a motion and a and second. Reese. And that so was item two on this. That's correct. It is item two, but it was the, the motion the first, that was. Okay. So, okay, I was going back to item one. Okay, so if we want to have a vote on item two, that would be great. So, all, yes, there is a second. Kristen, okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, let's go back to item one. The pictures, I mean the wreaths. Banners. Banners, excuse me. Okay, there's a motion but no second at this point. Is there a second? You're looking at me. You had something to say. Well, I'm not <laughs> going to say it until I hear a second. So. Okay, I'll second it for discussion's sake. Uh, Ed's motion with the amendment for uh, diversity. Okay, so I'll second it for discussion's sake. Yeah, thank you. If, and yes, if I may. Please. Um, I appreciate you know where this is coming from and trying to um, have a review of what goes into our village. Uh, I think that's important. Um, I think I do have a concern, uh, a couple of concerns. As one, you know, we have already established this new policy and we've put in the BIA through that hurdle uh, to meet it, come forth with it. They've done that um, and they've submitted, uh, you know, their. Um, images um, and their design, which I think for the most part are, are, are very appropriate um, and will enhance the village. If there are going to be a review of uh, any other posters, I would be concerned about having that go to the Arts Commission and particularly with criteria concerning content uh, are uh, issues of diversity. Um, I think that that would be going beyond what the Arts Commission um, is established to do. Um, and if there is the will of this council to do that, um, I think you should at least put it before the Arts Commission and let them accept that mandate before imposing it on them. Um, so I guess that that's what I would request is that it be made um, as a request to the Arts Commission and allowing them to maybe reject that request. 
So those those are my comments. Kristen, uh, oh, look I have a, a question. I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm looking through the streetscape decoration policy, and uh, forgive me if I'm misquoting you, uh, Councilman Bertwar. But you mentioned that it was in the policy that it needs to go to the Arts Commission. No, I said you the, the, like the policy says all things go to the City Council. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. My and, and, my apologies. I misunderstood. Yeah. Yeah, he wants no, it to go to. So um, I'd like the BIA um, representative come forth. Um, so I just want to confirm something. Um, in talking to merchants today, I found out that there is a timeline issue here. And if you could comment on that, because that could be appropriate right now. I mean, there's a timeline issue, but if, we're not, if we can't get it right the first time, then we can just, I mean, they're not up now. So we would like to get them up for a certain time, but if we can't, then. Okay, I yeah. thought there was a contract or something. It was just mentioned there's a timeline issue. I mean, there's probably a, a timeline on the quote, but other than that, I mean, I'm sure they'll honor the price regardless of when we do it. Okay, okay, that, that was my consideration. Yeah, I mean, we would like to get them up. We had some ideas on what we would like to get them up before the holidays, before the Surfing Santa and into the holiday season. But if we can't, then you know we'll take it back to the drawing board and try to fix it. How long did they take to make? I mean, I'm just, how much time do we have here? Two weeks to, to make them, so. Okay. So the fall, okay, something like that. Okay. You know, if we have, you know, something we can come back by, you know, mid-October, give us a month to try to figure it out, but that's up to you guys. Okay, mid-October would work. Okay. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Yes. So, thinking back to the genesis of this policy, which was the change in the light character, which obviously was how we got to the stage where we created a policy and brought things to city council for review. I think the biggest challenge around the lights was the process by which the BIA went about um, picking and identifying a change for the lights. And as a suggestion, that, that might be what we wanna see here is rather than bringing a design to the council and then having the council approve it and we find out later that it's not universally adored, suddenly the council would be owning this artistic choice. And so maybe the direction rather than going to the art commission is, is have the BIA identify a process for the selection of artwork. And there's a number of different ways in which they could do that. I'm not suggesting that I know what exact, exactly would be best for them. Um, whether it's an Instagram contest, whether it's going to the Art and Cultural Commission, whether it's a poll of all their membership, I think you could give that direction and say, look, we want you to just go through a process, and ensure that there is, there has been that process so that you can feel comfortable signing off on what it is. Just to toss that out as a suggestion. Um, sir, what was the process in this, re in this particular so case? We, we pulled with our communications manager, we pulled as much stock photos as we could, took maybe 40 photos, 15 of us that are on the board or attend the marketing events committee that volunteer, kind of went through the photos, nixed what didn't fall in the policy, which would be anything that had to do with business or lodging, um, and tried to find some stuff that would fit and represent the theme of the community, of what we had. Uh, we don't have a lot of photos, we have what we could take, and the ones we've, we've used over the years. I mean, the one on the bike, that was probably from two years ago. Um, so really the people that decided on these photos are the ones that volunteer their time and then come to the meetings come to the marketing events and, you know, put their input and volunteer their time. Yes. Ed, please. And then Kristen. Yeah. I, I, what I'm trying to avoid here is the dilemma we got into with the lights. Uh, and and I, I do believe, you know, we have many commissions that work for us. And we have parking problems. We used to refer them to the parking commission. Uh, we have an art and culture commission that serves at the will of the council. And I'm thinking that this is the body that we have that it's got an artist on it. It's got, I mean, I shouldn't be making the decisions about what pictures are going on the banners. And I appreciate that the VI has done their best effort to solicit the ones that they think are pleasing. But we have a commission that's recognized for their, their taste. And if we give them with a task, that's, their, their main purpose is to serve the will of the council. That's why we appoint those, the people on that commission. So I don't. I think that this is a good step to take. Uh, if these banners are going to be printed, they could be used for multiple years. Whatever we put on those banners should be something pleasing and, and to something that represents Capitola. And I'm worried about the quality of the pictures that are on there. So this is like a, a small step to guarantee that we can come back here and, and support the BIA. I'm all about the, 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 the signs. I'm all about a seasonal distribution, but I just want to make sure that the quality of what we put out there is something that has somebody who's concerned about that reviewing it. So, okay, uh, Kristen, what would you think? Yeah, I have a, uh, yeah, I have a couple questions. I'm not sure if this would be for our city attorney or our city manager or for the council as a whole. 
um, but I've got a couple comments slash questions. Um, the first one that I own personally is that I am embarrassed to admit that I did not acknowledge, notice the lack of diversity in these banners previously. And as someone who is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, I am embarrassed to admit that I did not notice that. Um, and, it is, and it is important. Um, the second, I have a question. There's 10, it, was there a limit to 10 banners? No, that was just to the pricing wise. We had, I think, like 25, but we figured the 10 down based on what we would need and some duplicates, that's kind of what we figured would, would work and fit sure. the budget. So I'm curious as to if the council has any interest in approving any of them <coughs> in piecemeal and saying we like these and the rest we would prefer reconsideration or if we would say or if not. That's my, that's my question. My personal opinion is I don't feel like I'm qualified to pick art, so I, I, I would Fair defer enough. to a commission. That's why I rec made the recommendation. Fair enough. No. Yeah. To answer your question, no. Sure. Okay. It was worth, worth a shot. Okay. Okay. Call for a vote on this. Um, oh. We don't have a. <laughs> we do have a. Oh, yeah. You Wait, seconded yeah, there's it on a motion. And, yeah, there is a motion. And, yeah, and you yeah. seconded it. Yes. Okay. Um, well, if I could more comments, respond okay. to Ed's um, suggestion uh, and maybe try to express my concern. I mean, one, I have confidence that the BIA is going to function um, in the interest of, of their own businesses uh, and therefore the city as a whole. Um, I think this is different from the lights because if any of these turn out to be inappropriate offensive to a majority of the people, they're easily removed and we can give direction to do that, assume that we always have that authority. Um, and maybe that will come through the Arts Commission, who knows. Um, but to me there's a difference between, because this is, this is commercial art um, and I don't believe that the Arts Commission is has any more expertise in commercial, what may be appropriately commercially, as opposed to their artistic and aesthetic views. Um, and I'm also concerned about putting the Arts Commission at odds with the BIA. Um, so I would just caution and request that if the council is interested in doing this, that it runs it by both bodies and get their input on this procedure and seeing if they are willing to accept that mandate um, instead of just imposing upon them and expecting them to do the right thing. That may not happen. It may not go in a direction um, that we, um, um, you know, expect it to. So those are just, and, and as the, your representative on the Arts Commission, those are my comments and, and hopefully you will take them to heart. Thank you. So I, I, you know, let me interject here. Um, I can see that as a motion that we first go to the BIA and the Arts Commission to see if this procedure would work first, and then come back to the City Council depending on that input. Well, I'll propose that as an amendment to the motion. Well, you can make that as a substitute motion, and we can vote on that first if that passes. Yeah, not a substitute. I wasn't trying to substitute the motion, but just amend the motion okay. in that respect. Would you accept that? Could, could you clarify the amendment for me again? The amendment would be that we would uh, take this matter, uh, of course, I mean, back to the BIA and to the Arts Commission and to get the input on um, their uh, reactions to the proposal um, um, and that it come back to the council before um, it's mandated that this be the procedure. I don't necessarily have a problem with that. It just delays the process, and I'm trying to expedite this with them. I, I felt that if we made a decision tonight, or could, if we could get this to the Arts Commission, they could make a decision rather quickly and then let the BIA make their direction. I think what's happened is the BIA has selected a group of pictures, so I, I don't see it as complicated. I think they could, if, you know, if, if they submit the pictures, the Arts Commission may say all of them are fine, or some of them are not, or there's lacking diversity, or maybe the quality of these isn't the kind of thing that they'd like to see on a banner. I mean, I, I, I do have tremendous respect for the Art Commission. I've yielded to them on many occasions. 
And I just don't see why we're not willing to use a commission that's at, that serves the will of the council. And I believe the BIA is really, uh, they want to do the right thing here. That's the message I get here, okay? They, they, the trees are not anything new and neither were the wreaths and, and this is something new and, and we need to treat it as something new. And, and I'm sorry, we need to learn from the mistakes we made in the past. So I, I, I'm, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to accept the amendment because I'm trying not to delay the process because I think that would pretty much, that process what you're suggesting would take them out of the first quarter. I believe it wouldn't work in the first quarter. Can I make an amendment sure. to the proposed amendment? <laughs> if Go for it. Oh, make well, your substitute amendment. I, I guess what I would say is if, if the question is either we take it to the Arts and Cultural Commission or we ask the Arts and, and Cultural Commission, is there, uh, could we find the common ground of we recommend that the Art and Cultural Commission review it and if they decline to do so, then it just comes back to us? I accept that, that. I accept that amendment. Is that a fair go-between? I mean, we're still essentially asking them if they will, and if they choose not to, they choose not to. Yeah, I, I view that as the same result as asking them. You're asking them. You're not telling them uh, that they have to be in this position and insert themselves into this position. So it would be so. a recommendation that they review that they have the right to decline. And when, when, when we've made recommendations to the former Parking Commission, we made numerous recommendations. We recommended the Parking Commission review this. Steve, I think you can verify that happened numerous times. So it's not an unusual practice. The purpose of the commissions is to serve the will of the council. Okay, so we have a motion with two amendments. amendments. Yes, so one for diversity and one to go to the Arts Commission to ask them if they would like to be involved. Take this on. Yes. yes, take diversity this Diversity and children. Ch diversity and children, okay. So um, are there any more comments? Well, I'd, I'll just add, and so you know, um, the Arts Commission just had their meeting um, last Tuesday. They won't meet again until the um, uh, October 8th. First October 8th, yeah, first Tuesday, it second like Tuesday in October. And can the BI uh, attend that meeting so that um, there's it's open to the public? Anyone it, can attend. Yeah, but I'm just asking, it might be a good idea somebody for the BI there. to, it's to not come. Myself, it'll be somebody. Yeah, great. And um, that's be part of the discussion. Okay, uh, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Story? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Botdorf? Aye. And Mayor Bertrand? Aye. Okay, so both have passed. So let's go on to strategic plan. Item 9B, Recreation Strategic Plan Group Update. Good evening, Nikki. Mr. Mayor, council members, uh, the item I have before you is to um, the to consider appointing a representative for the recreation strategic plan, the core team that is um, gathering with Blue Point, in order to um, conduct the program review. So, this. Um, core team is I've currently identified um, a list of stakeholder groups in our community that have some interest in recreation past present future um, and this is the list here before you um, individuals from those stakeholder groups have been contacted and invited to join the core team and so far the core team is um, about 10 individuals, so that includes staff and this stakeholder group. Um, ideally, the ceiling for that number would be 15 individuals. And um, so part of this council could uh, see if there is any other stakeholder groups that might be of interest, but um, for part of the project, this stakeholder um, group and staff will meet in order to kind of implement this timeline, um, which will begin with a kind of a kickoff um, conference call with the entire group in order to kind of set the stage so that we can be efficient in our first meeting um, that will hopefully happen in um, October. 
And at that first meeting, it will be reviewing existing conditions and do kind of some visioning and goal setting um, for how we want to move forward with a strategic plan, at which point there can be a report back to council. Um, and then the core team will again meet in November, potentially December, depending upon the, how the workflow is going, at which point that core team will work on strategies or recommendations or process of the information that we might have gathered from a community meeting um, so that in December we will have a strategic plan to um, offer to council for review. Um, and so uh, at this point, uh, for it's council discretion to appoint a representative um, to this core team. Um, we, there, it is a, it's a, hopefully a very rich group of um, individuals already and um, we will be reporting back on several levels or if there wants to be council representation on that group, we would invite that as well. Any questions? Okay, um, I don't know if anyone's interested in being on this. I am interested, but I'd like to know if anyone else is interested. Yeah, I'm just, oh, we could go to public comment, but I was responding to that, okay. So any public comment? <laughs> Sorry, I'm being reminded. I'm really thankful for the attention mm -hmm. from my city council members here. <laughs> okay. Um, Ed, any? No, I no? think it's okay. great that you're back to, back to city council, okay. So I'd like to have two on it because I see, you know, there's several of us that are very concerned about, and that's my thought, several is concerned about children's activities and uh, reaching out to children to be more involved in uh, what the Park and Rec uh, gives. And um, actually, I would like to propose two representatives from City Council. And I'm thinking if you bet or Kristen. I recommend Sam's story. Okay. To sit on this. <laughs> We're all just going to recommend each other. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> I thought for sure you were going to go for that one. Okay. You're one reason why I wanted to recommend too. Okay. Sam? Well, you have a young un on your heart, on, on your running around your house, so maybe. Yeah. I do. You I do. do. Um, Very energetic young un. You know, I, I'm happy to serve um, if that's the will of the council. <laughs> Um, and um, but I'm a bit surprised because it was Councilwoman Brooks who actually proposed this strategic planning, planning process uh, uh, and the focus on youth activities and other engagements concerning our recreational department. And so I was just a little surprised to see her um, passing the buck, so to speak. So, but if she's willing to reconsider, I'll certainly uh, uh, step aside. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Mayor, I, I would offer, you know, there, one of the purposes of forming community groups is to get input into these sorts of plans that the council can then weigh. And to some degree, having too many council members at the table sometimes tends to influence the outcome. Um, so there is an argument for maybe having less council participation because at the end of the day, you're going to be called upon to adopt it and you want to see the best recommendation possible from this group of, of constituents. So that, that, I don't know if it changes your thinking about having two council members on the committee, but it's certainly one factor to consider. Thank you, city manager. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I tend to agree with the city manager. I, 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 I'm ner there's already. I think uh, Nikki mentioned that you know ideally or something or optimum would be maybe not more than 15 people. There's already a dozen people there, and I think you know putting two people onto a, uh, two council people on a meeting it makes it top heavy. And and I, I think the idea that Nikki's got this great diversified group is is to get a lot of input. And I, and it, it, I wouldn't want it to look like we're making the decision. I, I really like to feel like this is coming from the public. I'd almost be to the point where I wouldn't even want to have a representative, but since the mayor eagerly wanted to volunteer, I'd think it'd be okay if there was one person, but I'm afraid that two people would be top heavy. That's, that's my recommendation. So, okay, Sam. Well, if I just, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me, and uh, with that, I'm reluctantly willing to step aside. Now, I'll make a motion that we just have the mayor represent us on this committee. Second. 
But I do have a question before we vote. Sorry, I, okay. I didn't have a question, question. earlier, and I Is just... Is it an amendment or a question? No, just no, a question, no, no, no. just a question. Um, in the... Uh, and excuse me, this might just be my uh, ignorance, but in the staff report, it, it lists the stakeholder groups, and one of them at the bottom is sports renter. Is that a company, or is it just like anyone that rents sports? Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, council members, we um, manage several rentals, field rentals, uh, soccer and our softball and tennis. And so we wanted to have representation of individuals that rent those spaces um, as that is a big part of recreation, but maybe a little bit more of an invisible part. Sure. Um, so that's what that sports renter I had a hard time phrasing that. No, that you. makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, before you go, Nikki, um, this is a little off the subject, but you know, I was talking to some people who play tennis here in Capitola, and um, this one guy he suffered an injury recently, and he couldn't play singles or you know doubles or whatever. But he did mention that he'd like a a, a wall. Uh, you know, a, a practice wall. And he went, I mean, I, I was stuck. <laughs> he was there for about 20 minutes telling me why a, a tennis wall would be great uh, as an addition. So I'd just like to put it out there for you. No walls. Sad work. What? No, walls are good for if you're a tennis player. It, it, we're building bridges, not walls. Okay. <laughs> oh, I, I think you know what I'm talking about. Thank okay. Thank I know you. it's a CIP thing, so. Right, we can look into that. Okay, thank you. I just and Nick, to put it Nikki, up. I just want to say thanks for all your hard work, and yes. yeah, you're really doing a great job in recreation. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you very much. Yeah, you came up at our mayor's meeting, and um, they were and Ted and um, you know Mr. Gonzalez were very pleased with your presentation at the uh, uh, trustee meeting, and there's a lot of excitement. Um, whatever you're doing is great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Um, wrong here again. So I guess it's item C, introduce an ordinance many in capital um, recreation by the finance. Okay. We're on to item 9C. So I guess Jim is here for this. Thank you. You, you have the floor this time. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, as the mayor said, this next item is city council member compensation. Uh, by way of background, you know, March 23rd, 2006, city council adopted ordinance number 901, adding section 2.04.275 to the capital municipal code, which uh, adjusted city council member salaries to $500 per month, which became effective following the November 2006 election. On March 14th of this year, the council requested that the fact the Finance Advisory Committee or FAC review council member compensation and that review took place on May 22nd at our regular Finance Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, just to provide a little bit of history, council member salaries initially were established at $75 per month in uh, February of 1966 and then increased to $150 per month in July of 1977, then $300 a month in July of 1991 and then as previously stated, uh, $500 per month in March of 06. Uh, the California Government Code allows for an increase of up to 5% for each calendar year since the last adjustment, and any increase approved does not go into effect until after the next municipal election, which again, the last increase was in December of 2006, increasing it from 300 to 500 per month, and the max at that time was 624. Maximum compensation for this adjustment would be calculated out to December of 2020, and that amount is 990 per month. During the review by the um, Finance Advisory Committee, we looked at comparable cities that are listed on the slide. Those are the same comparable cities that we're using for the employee compensation study that's currently underway. Uh, so it's uh, Santa Cruz, Wattsville, Marina, Seaside, Carmel, as well as Pacific Grove, Scotts Valley, Pismo Beach, Monterey, Gilroy, and Hollister. And we looked at the, the salary of the mayor. Some, some cities have a higher salary for the mayor than the council. We looked at population, overall revenue out of their financial statements and revenue per capita, and then compared um, 
what we have here in Capitola against the average as well as the median along those. Um, the, count, the, the FAC had a pretty spirited conversation around this topic uh, and eventually landed on making a recommendation to increase the, the salaries by 20% to 600 per month and uh, approve a first reading of the ordinance it is the recommendation is to approve the first reading of the ordinance amending the municipal code. Again, the increase would not go into effect until November of 2020 following the election. The maximum, again, is 990. And I wanted to point out that both uh, Mayor Bertrand and Vice Mayor Peterson are on the Finance Advisory Committee. They abstained from voting on this item. And the part their participation in the conversation was basically responding to questions from the other Finance Advisory Committee members. Uh, if approved, the fiscal impact is $7,000 a year which would begin in fiscal year 2021. The first year would be about half that amount and then 7,000 going forward. And that's 6,000 for um, the salaries and $1,000 mostly in employer payroll taxes. And that completes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. One clarification I just want to make, and Jim, Jim did say this, but I think it's worth stressing is because it's a little bit of an unusual format for us. Staff isn't making a recommendation on this. We are conveying the Finance Advisory Committee's recommendation. So if that didn't come through, or just, just for anyone in the audience who's watching, so that's, this is clear. Any questions of Jim? Any All questions? Right. Uh, Sam, sorry. Yeah, um, I just wanted to clarify one thing. Um, in the staff report on the recommended action, it says, um, $600 per month for members of the City Council to be effective upon the start of new terms of office following the November 2020 general municipal election. Um, uh, not all council members will be starting new terms at that date. Correct. So will those seats, uh, how will that work? Because the ordinance itself just says that the salary will be $600 per month. Well, commencing December 2020, the salary for city council members shall be $600 per month with no reference to new terms. It, it, would, yeah. it would apply to all council members. So, okay. if, so the new term is just, that's just like a trigger point. Correct. And we're going to tie it to the next election. Correct. And that's, that's in the government code. Great. Thank you. So it just applies to the newly elected people. No, it applies to all council members. Oh, I misunderstood. Okay. Whether they're reelected or or in okay. the middle of their term. But at that stage of election. Okay. Correct. Okay. I was thinking I wasn't going to get anything anyway. So. <laughs> okay. So any more questions? Any questions from people in the audience? Okay. Bringing it back for discussion. Ed. I think this is a great idea. Um, I think that uh, about a year ago, we, I, I led a, a uh, uh, ordinance to remove pensions from council members. And my reasoning behind that was I think it's important to pay council members for what they do now, not for what they do later. And uh, I think this kind of falls in line with that. I, I think uh, that the, the statistics definitely show that the council members across the board are undercompensated. And, uh, I, you know, I, I would have been in favor of going even higher. I, I think it's important to pay people while they're here doing the job. I don't think it's, as, as I stated a year ago, that, that we should be paying for compensation beyond the time you serve. But while you're serving, I, I, I think it's reasonable. I, I would have supported more, but I uh, make a motion to uh, adopt uh, $600. Is there a second? I'll second. Any other comments? Hold on. Oh, Susan, city attorney. Did you go out for public? We did. didn't know if you went out. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. We did do that. Okay. I actually did it on my own. No, he did. Time. <laughs> okay. Yvette. I have no comment. Oh, okay. Just one second. Kristen? No. Sam? So, in a way, it's a hard one for me to decide because I don't think any of us are up here to you know, pay for things on our budget at home and stuff like that. So primarily to me, it's, um, if this passes, it's a, it's a recognition that the city values our contribution. And like I said, the first time this was mentioned as an item, I think um, 
we all recognize that everyone involved in civil service on um, whatever level has nothing to do with compensation. I think it has a lot to do with how much you put out for the community because you love it. And um, so I will support this motion. And if it does get passed, I appreciate the fact that um, other members of the city council feel the same way. So all those in motion, no, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. So it passes. Thank you very much. So let's move on to item 9D. Environmental consultant for Capitol Mall redevelopment. Report, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Before you tonight is um, another step in building our team for the Capitola Mall redevelopment project. Uh, this evening I'll present to you the environmental consultant that, and the process we went through. So in May of 2019, we posted the RFQs. There was a 30-day period in which proposals came in. We did receive six qualifications. Um, staff reviewed the qualifications and we selected three that came to the top. Um, based on previous experience. And on July 17th, we had a panel of interviewers that was made up of two staff members here at the city, a representative from the county that works with the environmental review process in their planning department, as well as um, a principal planner from the city of Santa Cruz. Upon that review, uh, we, Dudek ca came to the top. Dudek's a local firm that is from Santa Cruz. Um, and after um, identifying Judec as the top selected firm, we worked with them through during the month of August on their scope and exactly an EIR is pretty, it's a technical review of the project and just really defining that scope and their pricing. Um, so this evening we're looking to um, formalize a contract with Judec. Their scope of work will include the project initiation, the EIR scoping, um, and having a scoping meeting on the project, preparing the administrative draft EIR, which will be publicized and reviewed um, it, through a draft EIR. After the draft EIR is completed, they'll update based on comments and produce a final EIR. Uh, mitigation monitoring and reporting will be put into place within their report. Um, and then they'll have their CEQA findings and then it will become go before the Planning Commission and City Council with the final project um, at the, during public hearings. The total contract cost with the not to exceed amount is $276,000, $276,470. Um, with that, it's quite an extensive amount of work that they'll be putting forth. The contract will be paid for by the developer. There'll be, typically we have a 21% administrative fee that we include onto any contracts that the city administers for a developer project. With this one, um, a previous, our, our planner, planning consultant, JAS Consulting, will be managing this contract for us. So the admin fee, the admin uh, cost will be at, we've decreased it to 5% to cover like billing costs and administrative responsibilities of the city, but we thought it would not be fair to do the complete 21% as I won't be the person managing this contract. It'll be our consultant um, with my oversight. So tonight we're recommending that the um, city council authorize the city manager to award the contract to DUDEC for $276,470 for the environmental services for CEQA related to the mall redevelopment project. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. One question from Ned, you need that? Yeah, i um, not sure about the, 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 the range of the scope and how far you, know, you can answer that, but my consideration is, is I have some concerns about what is on or not on that property. And would the scope include the uh, impact of a possible hotel on that site? If a hotel were proposed on the site, then it would look into the, it would scope that as well. So it's going to be based on the, when the submittal by, by Merlone Guy or not about what, what we're going to request in there. If it's not in their proposal, then it wouldn't be explored. 
So I, I should be clear that I'll go back and just discuss process a little bit. Um, we're right now um, the project will be reviewed as a conceptual review. There, it's a planned development that they've um, are will ultimately be applying for. But within our planned development process, the applicant is required to go through a conceptual review for first to make sure that the public benefits that they're um, suggesting meet the quality or meet the qualifications of what the city would like to see. So during that initial phase, if the city is requesting a hotel, when the actual plan development comes in, if they've agreed to it, that'll be reviewed as part of the overall project. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah. So my question is related to the actual s scope of services plan. Several times they mention optional tasks. Mm -hmm. Is that included? They just sound so great. So I just want to make sure that it's, they're included in the, in the agreement that the city manager would be approving. They are. Yep, the two optional tasks are included in the not to exceed amount. And um, the, the subcommittee chose this agency, and I noticed and I read that they worked in, they have worked in Santa Cruz County before. Um, can you talk a little bit about if they have a relation, they've had a previous relationship with Merlon Grier and their, their familiarity with Capitola and so forth? Sure. Um, I do understand, and after they were selected for this, um, Merle, Dudek was, is also, they're doing an amendment. I'm sorry, I'm going to, they're right now down at their, they were hired to do another job. There's, there's a project that they're working on currently that's being modified, and I do understand there is a relationship. It's a, um, that they're, they've hired them to do a separate review of an amendment to a previous EIR. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of that, with the team that we have, it's not related to DUDEC. DUDEC's a very large firm. Um, I don't have the employee number offhand, yeah. but I think several hundred employees, mm -hmm. and they do have a presence throughout California. So, okay. Um, so, DUDEC has worked for, I think, all of the local jurisdictions here in Santa Cruz County. They've worked for the city of Capitol in the past, and I do understand that they, as the community development director suggested, they are working on another Merlon Geyer project. I believe it's the Lagoon Hills project. Um, so, yeah, there are connections both to the city and to other Merlon Geyer projects. And, and just because I'm not familiar, that's to our benefit, right? That they have that familiarity. It doesn't hurt us in any way to, that they, you know, do you know what I'm, are you following? I, I mean, mean, absolutely. At the end of the day, the city and Merlon Geyer is in the same page that we need to have an adequate, legally defensible environmental document. Okay. And the city will be defended in any legal challenge, if that were to come about, um, would be defended by Merlon Geyer. So we have, the exact same interest in preparing the best possible environmental document that can withstand a legal challenge. And so their, their familiarity with our city, our region, and these types of projects is an asset. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, in going through the scope of work, um, there seems to be um, little in timeline, and I think that's appropriate because we don't yet know what the project fully is going to be and how long the sequel public review and analysis may take. Um, uh, other than uh, under um, DUDEX, when they talk about the notice of preparation, they talk about a 30-day period. Mm -hmm. That seemed to be a fixed time. Um, but, and, and that right now, it feels kind of short. But do we have the ability to extend times um, and um, as we work through this process uh, without having it affect that bottom line? Um, and, and I understand that that's mostly Merle and Geyer's bottom line, but w will we be able to take the time we need to do this in the appropriate way without having the um, cost go up? So th that, that is a trick to all EIRs is uh, timing and cost as you get public comment on these. Um, I think the process that we have in place with a conceptual review of the application prior to the actual mm -hmm. application comes in will be, it, it will take additional time in the overall scope of things rather than just uh, submitting an application. But it does save them, I believe, in the long run 
for asking for additional changes and modifications to the plan because the conceptual review, you have that early feedback prior to the EIR moving forward and them understanding uh, what the council desires in the project and bringing forth a project that they know will work. So I do think in that, in that sense, you'll be saving them time by getting those early, the early comments in. Um, and then of okay. course, during the, the process, they'll have to, um, if, if time, you know, time is of importance, I think, for the developer, of course, but any time we need in order to make sure that everything's been reviewed thoroughly and we have the best and most accurate information, we'll be taking that time to ensure that. Okay. All right. Thank you. One, I had one other question. Uh, in their scope of work, um, in, in terms of the deliverables, the final deliverable, they on the EIR. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk about hard copies, but they also talk about CD-ROMs. I haven't heard that terminology <laughs> used in, in technological terms ages ago. Um, so I, I was wondering, I mean, uh, could we add memory sticks or yeah, that? Yeah, for I mean, sure. So <laughs> some people I'll, may. I'll highlight that for them. I'm sure it's okay. just standard language. They keep and and maybe, I mean, maybe a few CD-ROMs, but. <laughs> floppy disk? I don't have a CD-ROM on my computer. I want a floppy disk. Oh. <laughs> um, anyways, so that, those are my comments. Thank you. Okay. Chris, I have a quick follow-up. Um, on, on page 86, it, it does mention, um, uh, in the co it's, it's actually in the cost estimate. Changes in the project description, anticipated one-year schedule. So, so does that mean that these items, one through eight total, are anticipated to take about a year? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions? I have none. And is there a motion to recommend that this contract <coughs> be awarded? So moved. And any, excuse me, hold on, any comments from the audience, please? Okay, I hear a motion. I'll second the motion. Okay. Sorry, who is the motion? Uh, Kristen made the motion. And um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So it passes. Okay. Thank you very much for that report. So let's move on to the last item. 9E. Ordinance. Municipal code pertaining to development agreements. Okay. Also in preparation for the mall redevelopment project. Um, so... Um, this evening before you is a draft um, ordinance for a development agreement. Um, ordinance, in, and what is a development agreement? A development agreement is a contract be between a developer and the city. It's a, a tool that you can utilize for planning that allows um, greater latitude within a development to advance the policies of, of the city. So your general plan policy is in a greater latitude within projects. It also allows the public agency to have more flexibility in the um, conditions that will and requirements of a project. Mm -hmm. And for the developer, they get assurances through the project entitlements. So there's uh, the contract that's put into place provides um, clarity for both parties and knowing what the outcome will be. Um, the development uh, agreement in the draft ordinance, it will define the duration, the permitted uses, the density and intensity of uses, um, height, the maximum building size and dedications. There'll be an indemnification clause, benefits to the city will be outlined, um, and any additional terms and conditions. So within these, you're allowed to ask for additional benefits to the city and it's all written out within an agreement. Um, the development agreement process that we've drafted, so within the state law, we're allowed to move forward with the development agreement without having an ordinance in place. The purpose for this ordinance is really to outline the process for the applicant and to have a more transparent process when a developer comes in. So within our development agreement process, we've laid out the initial review of when they come in and bring in an application and the city process of the planning department making sure that the um, application is complete. From there, it steps into negotiations and that is at the direction of the city manager. Um, the, when the project is reviewed, ultimately the development agreement is reviewed by the planning commission and given a recommendation. City council will actually take the action on the development agreement 
Um, and then it is executed within state law. It has to be executed, I believe it's within 10 days, and that's what's in our ordinance. And then the we set annual reviews tied to a development agreement. So all the agreements that are put in place, if there's timelines for, say, the establishment of a park or a, a other public benefit, on an annual, we'd have an annual review of the de development agreement and making sure they're on track, and if they're not on track, um, amending the agreement and the agreement timelines. So, and there's also a way within a development agreement that's in our ordinance to specify that if they weren't to carry through with their obligations, what the process is to um, nullify a development agreement. So with that, staff is recommending the approval of the first ordinance of the development agreement ordinance, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay. This might be a question for our new city manager. Welcome. You just promoted first. me, I think. <laughs> our <laughs> city attorney. Excuse me. Excuse me. That I have the be. much easier <laughs> job. Yeah. Oh, oh, just boy. <laughs> she sat up. I thought maybe you knew Surprise something everybody. I didn't know. <laughs> we have new news. She's blushing. Yes, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, so reading this over there is um, some verbiage beginning on page 89 uh, regarding low-income housing developments. It's mentioned again on page 90. And when thinking about the definition of low-income low housing, I'm curious if that ties us to that exactly, if instead we chose to focus on workforce housing or senior housing. You know, there's a lot of other terminology, so my question is, does this tie us to that? That's a good question. Um, and I think the answer is no. However, we could broaden the language to um, make it clear that it doesn't. You know, in general, the purpose section of an ordinance is um, it's not necessarily a limitation. So even though I don't think the language ties us to, um, I, I think affordable housing is the term that the code uses, and then that's where it talks about income restrictions right. based on uh, area median income, AMI, uh, mm -hmm. 80, 120, 100. I don't think that ties, this ties us to that, but I was talking about this with the city manager, and if you would like, we came up with some, oh my goodness, wow. So Were you guys reading my mind? Capitola. <laughs> so this might address your question. I think this would broaden the language a bit. So this is in the intent section two. Mm -hmm. And the language would, Councilwoman Brooks was highlighting the word low income here and this is said changes it to say facilitates the development of complex projects and then provides examples such as multi-faith projects, income restricted housing developments um, and developments involving public service. So if you wanted to look at something like workforce housing, you would almost certainly still income restrict those units. It would just be to a higher income than that, which is contemplated in the code set in state law. So you would probably restrict in workforce housing to whatever, 120 to 140 or 140 to 160. So it would still be income restricted. So I think this would capture your concern. Okay. And I guess my follow-up question is that we're not restricting ourselves. This would not be restricting ourselves too much. I don't think so, which is, okay. we talked about that as well, which is I think if you add in such as, I think you make it very clear that these are just examples of projects that could be governed by development agreements. It's not an exhaustive list. And then I guess the, the follow-up is that we would continue using that language on any other agreements, documents, and so forth, and or perhaps with our zoning code updates i don't know if like all of that do we do we need to find continuity with within all documents from here on out regarding low, how we use that terminology I, you know what i'm do you, are I, you I don't think i don't think we do i'd want to know exactly where in your code you're referencing it but i i just i think income restricted is so broad mm -hmm. that it would capture any other references in your code okay i just wouldn't want to be challenged to that they would come back and say, well, in your zoning code or, you know, or your local, I'm getting them usually mixed up, the local plan or whatever, general plan. You know, I don't want us to, to be charged with that. Like, oh, hey, no. here it says something different. 
versus here and I wouldn't want them I wouldn't want that to be an argument so I, I think you'll be fine if you broaden the language here which is okay. what this would do okay as opposed to narrow it thank I you think you'd be good welcome city attorney thank you very much okay. I'm happy to be here Kristen. yeah is uh, just out of curiosity is there a is this to imply that any housing multi-unit housing development that isn't income restricted does not require a development agreement so development agreements generally are only entered into voluntarily between the city and a developer since i've been here we have not had a development agreement on any project mm -hmm. so really it would come about it's really these complex projects the last development agreement that i know that the city entered into was for brown ranch there is a minor exception um, in that in our affordable housing overlay, I think we require development to, that utilizes the affordable housing overlay to get a development agreement, but we've never had an application for it. So is there any reason that we wouldn't just say housing developments instead of having anything to do with income? I mean, if, the, if, if what we're saying is that we're trying to facilitate development, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm all about facilitating development specifically for income restricted and, and and whatnot. Um, I guess I'm just trying to understand further why we're including the low income aspect of it in general, rather than just saying that house, we're, we're facilitating the development of, of housing. So nothing I think that you put in here, particularly with this language as it reads now, which says facilitates the development of complex housing projects, or complex projects, <clears throat> No, nothing here is going to limit you in how you use development agreements down the road. And so development agreements really come about when there's a complex project, it's going to be built out over a number of years, there's impacts on public services, there's things the developer is going to do, there's going to be impacts on our streets and roads, and so we're trying to come to some sort of negotiated agreement about what they're going to do and what we're going to do. Um, oh, I see. okay. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. I, I would add that practically, any multi-phase development that includes housing will almost certainly include affordable housing because the city has an inclusionary housing ordinance. Okay. Okay. Or income restricted housing. I, right now you're See my point. Yeah. Right right now I don't think your IHO contemplates housing other than what is defined as affordable, but if you wanted to broaden that you could and it would necessarily be a part of housing developments. Okay. Okay, I think I understand now. So this isn't necessarily um, saying that larger housing developments wouldn't need a um, development agreement, but it's indicating that if there's going to be income restricted housing, then the developers would thereby, uh, therefore, be um, required to stick to that agreement within the development agreement to have those income restricted units. They couldn't later say we're not going to have income restricted units because that would be in the development agreement, correct? Right. That's right. Okay. Thank and you. again, almost any multi-phase development, it, the developer will almost certainly want to enter into a development agreement in order to vest the entitlements. Okay. All right. Thank you. Same? No, my question was answered. Thank you. Okay. And I'm fine with this too, so thank you very much. Any comments from the public that is here tonight? Seeing none, back to City Council for action. Uh, I have a motion to adopt the ordinance. Do you want the with amendment? With the amendment presented by staff. Second. Okay, with the amendment. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So passes. Thank you very much. Thanks. Meeting is over. Thank you very much. Thank you.